Uh, my name's Henry Smythe, and I'm the headmaster at Gilman. And I want to, first of all, welcome everybody here, and, and thank you as well for showing up. I, <laughs> I'm not sure why I feel the need to apologize for the weather. I have absolutely nothing to do with the weather, but um, I do. I'm, I'm sorry that it is, it is as hot as it is, and I, I think everybody has noticed that we do have water stations around the arena, so please don't feel bad to get up in the middle of, of the presentation if you need to wet your whistle. So thank you for being here. It's always great to hold events where we can draw members from a larger community together to engage in discussion about things that we think are important. And as a school that's dedicated and focuses on the development and growth of boys, we are particularly excited about this event um, tonight. And we're so pleased that you could join us. Your attendance, and we've had to change plans mid midstream when the, the responses were overwhelming over the, over the last three weeks. And, and we've gone from plan A to plan B in terms of, of hosting everybody. And your attendance here, it speaks volumes about two things, I think. One is the importance of the topic of boys and, and their growth and their development, physical, social, spiritual, ethical. And two, it speaks volumes about Rosalind Wiseman's place and role in that discussion. So we are absolutely thrilled that she could join us here tonight. And before I get into my sort of official introduction of, of Rosalind, one other logistical thing. There are books available for sale in the back in the, the lobby of the arena. If you, haven't, if you don't have a book and are interested in getting one, and Rosalind will be signing books um, at the end of this event as well, also in the arena. So my official uh, introduction of Rosalind Wiseman reads like this. Rosalind Wiseman is an internationally recognized expert on children, parenting, bullying, social justice, and ethical leadership, and the New York Times bestselling author of Queen Bees and Wannabes and Queen Bee Moms and Kingpin Dads. Each year, Wiseman works with tens of thousands of students, educators, parents, counselors, coaches, and administrators to create communities with dignity. Wiseman has been profiled in the New York Times, People, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, The Washington Post, and USA Today, and is a frequent guest on The Today Show, Anderson Cooper, CNN, Good Morning America, and NPR affiliates throughout the country. The unofficial uh, bio and welcome for Rosalind is that she and I uh, got to spend some time together this summer in Richmond, which was host and home of the annual conference of the International Boys School Coalition. And by coincidence, we have a mutual friend who's from Richmond and drove us around from point to point during the conference. And much like an eight-year-old boy, he rarely takes a straight line from point A to point B. And so we got a lot of time to, to visit with each other as the, the conference went on. Beyond the impressive bio, beyond the book covers and the Today Show um, appearances is a real human being, a mother of boys, and a fantastic person. So it is with, with increased and, and, and special excitement that we're able to welcome her here today. Um, so without further ado, Rosalind Wiseman. Thank you. Hi, everyone. All right. What I'm going to try and do is bring you into the world of boys. So this is what I want you to think about. Imagine that you have a seventh grade son, and he's invited to a swim party. And two weeks before, he casually asks you to get him a swim shirt, but he didn't say anything about why he needed it. There was no actual special thing he said to you that would indicate that he needed to get it for a particular reason. So understandably, you file it away under, I will get, him a swim sh I will get him the swim shirt at some point, and you forget about it. You don't get it, get it for him in time for the party. Now, the day of the party arrives. You can't find him. You call his name, and he doesn't answer. And then you call it like a little bit louder, you know, that like second time you call your child, with a little bit more right from here, doesn't answer. 
Then you do the like third time when you're calling your child and you're really like, where are you? You need to answer me right now. And you hear that he's upstairs. So you go upstairs and there he is playing a video game. He is completely not prepared at all to go to the party. No towel, no nothing. And you look at this and, you're like, and you are completely frustrated because you know that he should be going, what, ready to go to this party. And you do not understand what is going on except for the fact that you think that he has had way too much screen time and he's completely addicted to video games. Now you get him in the car and he's sullen going to the party and you think he's sullen because he's going through video game withdrawal. So you try and like have a conversation, he doesn't really answer you, and you're actually not in a really good mood, you're actually super irritated by the time you drop him off at the party. A few hours later, you, come, you, you are determined to start fresh, and you pick him up at the party. And when he gets in the car, what you say is, did he have a good time? And he says, it was fine. You ignore his sullen attitude. You cheerily ask him, who is there? Who is there? And he says something like, I don't know, some people from school. And in two minutes, you are back to feeling completely annoyed and completely rejected and totally underappreciated. And he is still in a really bad mood. He gets home, and the first thing that he does is he goes into the refrigerator, he grabs something to eat, which is going to fall all over the floor, and he goes up to the nearest or best screen in the house, he picks the most violent game he can possibly choose, the most violent game within that game, and there he sits on the couch eating the food that's dropping to the floor, and he is blowing something up as violently as possible. And you look at your child and you think, he is turning into a violent video freak kid, and there is nothing that I can do about this. But here is what you don't know. What you don't know is that during the party, while he was swimming and got out, of the got out of the pool, that one of the boys in the group took a picture of him without his shirt, off, his shirt on, right, because he's swimming, and this kid has been calling him boob boy or moobs and teasing him about having moobs for a really long time. And what you don't know is that he has been your son when he knew that this guy was coming had been hoping that this child was going to like break his arm before the party and he was not going to be able to come to the party. But he was there. And when he was there, not only did he take the pictures, but there were other guys that your son has been hanging out with forever and one of them swam away, right? Didn't want anything to do with it and swam away. Another laughed, another encouraged him to take more pictures. So you don't know any of this. And you go back and have him in your car and you're incredibly frustrated. So he isn't running, and this is the thing I want us to start with, that he isn't running to that video game for no reason. He's running to distract himself from the shame he feels about his body, because boys very much have incredibly strong lessons coming at them about what they should have and be like for their bodies. He is incredibly angry at this kid, but he doesn't know how to shut his tormentor up. And he has a deeply wired belief that he cannot tell you what happened. And if he does tell you what happened and you know about it, you are going to make the problem worse. So in the 20 years that I've worked with boys and girls, I have known boys like the target, like the, your son in this situation, and I have known boys like the perpetrator. And I've also known all the other kinds of boys, the one that swam away, the one that laughed, the one that said, take the other picture. So here's the thing that I've always tried to figure out. How is it possible to understand the group dynamics that are going on with these boys, and how do we make it better? Now, how, did we figure, how do I figure this out? What I've done in the last two years is I decided that I was not giving good enough advice to boys. Boys have been coming up to me for years and asking me for advice about their problems with their parents, with friends, with girls, with coaches, that they needed help. And I realized that there were many times, way too many, when I was looking at boys and I could tell from the way they were looking at me that I was giving them advice that did not work. Now I don't know, for you know, teachers in the room, you probably know this, look. It's this look that when you say something, they've come to you for advice and their eyes just sort of drop for a second 
And in that one little drop of their eyelids, what they're saying is, okay, I came to you for advice and you are giving me really stupid advice that I can never, ever, ever actually implement into, implement into my own life. It's not gonna work, you are useless to me. I have to tell you that I've gotten that look and I don't like getting that look. Because boys deserve our best. So what I do though is that that look is really motivating to me because I don't like being ineffectual for kids because our kids deserve the best. So what I did was I decided that I was gonna write this boys book and I was gonna write two books. I was gonna write one for the parents and for people who care about boys and that's Masterminds, that thing right there, down here, if you can see it. And then the other is I was gonna write a book for the boys themselves. And I was gonna write it so that it would be an e-book and that they could have it in their phone or on their device and that when they were dealing with a big, big problem, that they wouldn't have to take out a book or go find it in the library, that they could just look for it and say, okay, I'm in fifth grade or it's eighth grade, girls are making me miserable, page 75. Um, a boy is making me miserable, page 89. I just made an enormous mistake that my mother just found out about and I might have lied really, really badly. What do I do, page 121? For high school boys, you know, people have their licenses. These are the five things that I absolutely have to do when I am pulled over by a police officer. Here are the five things that I may not do, I should not do when I am pulled over by a police officer. So what we did was a book for boys and a book for people who care about boys. But I'm a woman, right? I mean, I've been a teacher for a long time, but it doesn't make me an expert on boys. It doesn't make me an expert on girls either. What I can do is listen to them. And so that's what I did. I stopped. I stopped talking to boys and telling them what I thought was going on. I started listening to them. And so what I did was I went around to schools around the country and I said, can you please help me? Can you give me groups of boys, all different kinds of boys? Not just like the kids that, you know, if you want to like bring them to make you, your school look good, which we all do, it's not a bad thing. Not, I don't want just those kids, I want all different kinds of kids. And I want them from elementary school through high school. So I went out and I got schools from all over the country, from New Orleans to California, to Boston, to um, Louisville, Kentucky, to boarding schools, public schools, charter schools, all different kinds of schools, including, by the way, this one. So one of the teachers in the lower school, Laura, caught, writes me on Facebook and says, I can help you with this. And so we were able, with the fourth and fifth grade, to, to using a program that's amazing called Edmodo to be able to work with the kids to get wonderful answers from them about what their lives look like. So I went around the country and I talked to boys and I said to them, what am I doing that's wrong? What do we need to know? What are the things that adults are doing that make you not want to talk? What are the things that adults are doing that makes you want to talk? How, why are you passionate about things? What do you care about? What are you scared of? What are th girls doing that are driving you crazy? What are your parents doing that are driving you crazy? And so from that, we came up with these books. Now, I'm gonna tell you because I have a, there, I have to, there's a lot of things I didn't know. But I wanna tell you one of the first things that the boys promised me, I would say. The boys asked me that when I was talking to parents, when I had the opportunity to be in a public space to talk to parents, that I would give you a couple of things that are very important to them. Number one is this. I have to put my thing down because I, I didn't figure this out. Hold on my second. I can't figure it out. Okay. This is what they really, really, really would like for you to know. And I, if you saw me on the Today Show, I talked about this for about 20 seconds today, which in a four-minute clip is actually segment is like a long time. So here's the deal. When the issue of boys saying, I'm fine, when you say, how was your day? And they say, I'm fine. What did you do? I'm good. Those, those conversations, and you feel like you can't get past them. Here's what's happening from their perspective. The boys feel very, very, very strongly that when they see you at the end of a school day for the first time, you know, you've picked them up from school, you've come back from work, it's the first time that you've seen them, especially though when, you've, when they're getting into the car, when they're picking you up, when they're, you're picking them up. They perceive your well-intentioned questions as an absolute inquisition. So you saying, 
So how was your day? How were the kids? Did you do your great? Did you do this paper? Did you get something back? How did that teacher do? How was your practice? Did you do well? All of these things to them are absolutely overwhelming. And one of the kids said to me, it is exactly the same as if when my, parent, when my mom or my dad comes home from work and the first thing I say before they even get through the door is, did you get through all of your emails today? Why didn't you get that promotion? Well, do you need to keep working on it? Well, what's going on? Do we need to work on this? You need to show me this right now. Well, are you okay? I think you're, I'm worried about you, right? Now, so if we see it from their perspective, it looks really different. Our well-intentioned requests for information look like an interrogation and people shut down. However, we do have a right to know a little bit about what's going on with our kids. So in order to get through the I'm fine, what I would do is I want you to, I'm suggesting that you think about it like this. When your kid comes into the car or when you see them at home for the first time, if you have a relatively emotionally stable and healthy relationship with your child, when they come and sit down, like get into the car, they are letting go of the armor that they have, that they've been carrying around with them at school. Now they could go to the best school in the entire world and they still feel like they've got a certain persona that they have to walk around school with. So when they get into your car, they can let that go. And a lot of that persona is really connected to being able to be, invul to be as invulnerable as possible in school to other boys. That you have to laugh things off if you're embarrassed. If, they go, if people go after you, you don't take it seriously. Nothing is serious. That nothing bothers you. That you know how to go back at people verbally. That you're tough. That you can handle your business. So that armor, if you have an emotionally safe relationship with your son, should go away. And that's why he wants to decompress. So allow him to decompress. And then you can go talk to him later. So the things that, of course, for me, as a mother of two boys that are 10 and 12, who are very good at not telling me anything, is that I talk to them when I'm sitting on their bed, when the lights are out so they don't have to look at me, and the second is they both play basketball, and so what I do is I volunteer to throw them the ball so they, when they practice shooting. Like in our, backyard, in our backyard, we have like a driveway with the hoop. So I, I volunteer to throw the basketball to them. I, I, have, my, I have a 12-year-old who's 6 feet 1 and 175 pounds. I can't really play basketball with him anymore. But I can throw him the basketball, and we can have extremely deep conversations when we're doing that. Couple, another, a, other, a few tips, too. I also, when talking to the boys, realize this. Moms, I think we might, well, no, dads can do this, too. If we're really angry at our children, I'll speak for myself. My children are often in trouble. They are often doing things that are highly irritating or have a very strong opinion about that I don't like what they're doing, okay? I have realized when I'm very, very frustrated with them that I need to focus on a particular strategy when I'm talking to them if I have any chance of them listening to me. And this is what I have come to. It's you say, you, right before you're going to go talk to them, you focus on three things that you want to say. And these three things, these three points, you will say no matter what he does to distract you, annoy you, or push your buttons. Okay? Three things, three points, and you do it in approximately three minutes. If you hear yourself start to repeat what you're saying, give up. Because it's not, there is not only diminishing returns, there is no returns at a certain point. Okay? Does that make sense? So, if you, you know what? It's hard to not repeat ourselves when we're dealing with somebody who is so good sometimes at shutting us down. Think of your three points, three minutes, no repeats. Now, but what is the larger context or what's the larger reason why we're doing this? The larger reason why we're doing this is because boys need, as Henry talked about, a, a language, a way to be able to talk about what's important to them, to be able to go to the whole boy, the whole child, the, about being able to create a way for him to be an ethical, strong, confident young man who is proud of how he's handled things even if things were messy, especially if things were messy. So we get caught up really easily and not thinking that boys have complex lives or that they are really bothered sometimes when we see when they're doing things or seeing other people do stuff. 
that they don't like, that they, in, in their gut, feels wrong to them. And one of the reasons why I think that that's happening is because overall in the culture, we really have lacked a credible language for the boys to talk about their experiences. In comparison to girls, who've had a long history of people giving them not only a language to talk about their feelings, but also to be able to inspire them to say, girls, you're up against some really big things. There is sexism in this world. There is gender privilege in this world. And you have the right to do whatever you want. Now, I know that there is, I absolutely believe that there in some, absolutely believe that there are some aspects of gender privilege that are still occur. But let me absolutely tell you that from the perspective of a 13-year-old boy looking at a 13-year-old girl, he does not think that he's the one that's in control. Now, we know as women and as educators, as men, that a 13-year-old girl who, ha who has gone through puberty and looks like she's 18, we know that it's a very, it can be a very difficult life for her when she walks down the street, when she is, it go, got, you know, she's a freshman in high school and older boys are paying attention to her. We know that, that's a pro that that can be really problematic for her. We know this. But when you are a 13-year-old boy and you are looking at that girl, you do not think that way. So we can talk to boys about these issues of girls, and I want us to, but we have to be able to see it from their perspective. Otherwise, they are not going to listen to a word we say. So I want us to think about being able to give boys a language to be able to talk about their experiences and to be able to frame the, the conflicts, the problems, the betrayals, the just natural things that they're, the common things that they're going through so they don't feel ashamed for being affected by it. So here's one of the things for those of you who have younger boys or have had younger boys. One of the things I think we do sometimes is we think, well, boys like to play with trucks and you know, lots of boys like to play with trucks and they love to light things on fire no matter what their age and they love to watch things explode. And girls like to sit and talk to each other. We make, I believe, a very faulty, wrong connection because we think of boys liking to light things on fire and exploding things. That because they like to do those things, for some reason, they also don't really care about their relationships. Think about that. That we look at the sort of surface of the boys and say, they just like to explode things, they like to rough house, and then we make an assumption that their friendships are not important to them, or they don't feel lonely, or they don't feel joy, or they don't feel that they fall in love and they, they get their hearts broken. So we're making this leap that I think is really damaging, not just to the boys, but our ability to reach them and create an environment for them to even talk to us in the first place. So think about that for girls and for boys. And then I want to show you what I think is the overall message or the overall goal of what we're trying to get to. So this is the way I look at education from an overall point of view. Happiness is meaning beyond oneself. You get happiness. You, it's, you will have this. You have a hope of success, not a guarantee. You are socially connected, and you have satisfying work. I want to go back to the boys and their work with me. I will speak for myself that writing these two books was a joyous experience. And the reason it was for me was because it met these four criteria. And how is it, if you think about it, that I got boys for two years to write me back every single day by text, by email, meeting me all the time, constantly getting back to me. Why would these boys do this? Because I was giving them no reward except if they did a good job, I would give them a college recommendation. That was it. Because I think it met these four criteria. And that's what school, I believe, should be. Now, within the groups, what we talked about with the boys is that their friendships are incredibly important to them. But conflict is inevitable, inevitable among people, and so is abuse of power. And ironically, one of the ways in which you learn this is in your inner circle of friends. And so I'm one of, for queen bees and wannabes and the girls, I'm known for being, like, putting these labels on girls. And I asked the boys if they thought it was appropriate for them. And I have to tell you that the boys 100% believe that it was appropriate to them. 
And we spent hours and hours and hours debating the names and what the criteria was for each person. So in this inner circle, what's important to realize is that what we learn in our friendships carries with us as we get older. So for boys, if they are learning that there's the kid who has the most social power, has, that they have no chance of confronting this person successfully, they will learn to be quiet. Now, what do I mean by conflict, right? Because I said conflict is inevitable. In boy world, it starts with things like, I mean, these are not monumental physical fights I'm talking about. I'm talking about who decides what video game you're going to play. Who decides who's going to get shotgun? Who decides where you're going to go eat? Who decides what music is the right music to, to like? Who decides who decides? These are the conflicts that seem so innocuous that it shows the boys, and it's not, but it's not, it shows the boys who has power to dominate and to decide what the group is going to think. So I'm going to show you some of the roles. So a mastermind directs the group's movement. So if you're in middle school, if you watch like a middle school group of boys, actually this goes for a lot of people, whoever gets up first is the person with the most social power. Okay. He gives ultimate approval to his friends about everything, from shoes to political choices to which girls are hot to what you do at a party and how are you going to decide your moral choices there. You're not sure how intelligent he is until he is threatened. This was very, very tricky. This took me a very long time to figure out because working in schools as long as I have, I have had experiences where afterwards this kid did something super, super Machiavellianly genius and my reaction to it at first was, how does that kid do that? That kid is not that smart. It's they hide it. They hide their genius and they, it comes out in very strategic times. An associate gathers information, is the social point person, so he's the person that's taking the information on his phone about where they're going to go and then he tells the mastermind and the mastermind decides where they're going to go. And he has the best ability to stand up to the mastermind. A bouncer. Now you can sort of see where the boys decided what the names were, right? Because I would never have come up with these names. They would have been much, much worse. Can't read people's motivations. You really can see this in eighth grade, actually. I think this is where you see this the most. Struggles academically and takes the fall for the mastermind and the associate because he has twisted in his brain that loyalty to his friends means doing things to back them up when they are doing something unethical. Now, one of the things I want you to think about that these boys are very, very good at is they're very good, especially the mastermind and the associate, at dismissing adult authority. So when they're walking out of a principal's office, when they walk into a head's office, they could have just gotten so much in trouble and they were crying, begging for forgiveness. And they walk out of the office and they make some snarky comment to everybody because, so that everybody else thinks they got completely, got, um, got off scot-free, which is really irritating. You know why, from a head of school's point of view? Because sometimes the parents believe those kids. They walk outside in the hallway and they say, nothing happened, right? No, it's no big deal. And then the kids all hear it and they believe it and they think, that, some, that these kids have did some horrible, horrible thing and they got off scot-free. But the head of the school or the dean can't say to anybody what really happened because then it would be a total breach of professionalism and confidentiality. So then there's this thing about, oh yeah, we let them off completely, which is sometimes really absolutely not true. It's just the strategy of the kid as they walked out of the office. It is very tough being a head of school. Very tough and irritating sometimes and awesome. The fly. The fly builds his friendships by bragging or buying. So I want you to think carefully about how parents fit into these dynamics if they are buying things for their child because they think that it will make him have more friends. And it, you can trick yourself. A well-meaning parent can do this easily. Like, well, why don't you invite your two friends to this really expensive concert that's really hard to get tickets for, right? So it's those kinds of things that a parent might think if they have the means, this is a nice thing to be doing, when if this kid is the fly, what's really happening is these kids don't necessarily like the fly, they're using him. And, and the kids across the country absolutely confirmed that this was happening all the time, that they were seeing this 
often, consistently, in the uh, groups of boys. He hovers outside the group, and other boys have no guilt excluding him because they think that he's annoying, which is in no way are they then beyond working him and using him. Now, there has been a lot of stuff about girls and relational aggression and how sophisticated and manipulated they are. This is very manipulative. Boys can do this, absolutely. The entertainer, obnoxious but not mean, Whoops. good at making people feel comfortable, and has a hard, term, high, hard time excuse me, turning himself off. So if you have this kid sometimes, or if you're teaching this child, it's like, can you just stop talking? Just stop talking. You're adorable, you're funny, but you really have got to stop talking, okay? All right, next one, the punching bag. He's the easy target, not amongst all the kids, but amongst the inner circle. The inner circle believes that they can treat him badly. I did not know about this punching bag until I did this work. So what they say is, we love him, so we can treat him however we want, but nobody else can treat him like this. And what happens, because he wants a sense of belonging, which is human, right? It's human nature to want a sense of belonging, it's not weak, is that he justifies how the boys treat him and apologizes sometimes on their behalf. The conscience, one more. He worries about rules and consequences. It's, the boys sometimes think of him as they get older, like having a chaperone, because he is somewhat likely to say something like, that thing we're about to do is really stupid, dangerous, going to get us in trouble. So sometimes you don't want this person around. But sometimes he can be a very effective screen in talking to adults. Like, yes, I'm, I know we're really, we're really loud. I'll totally quiet down. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Wiseman. And he means it. He feels bad about it. He's not being fake. He feels bad about it. But the boys know that they can get him to do it, right? And there's some sincerity there. The last person is the champion. The champion, and we had a very last, the boys recently said to me something really, really funny which was the champion is a guy that is able to maneuver in this group and, have, and be authentic, right? He can hold his own. He's liked, but he can hold his own, especially when the boys are doing something that is contrary to what he believes to be right. The, the issue with the, con, with the, you know, every parent is like, I want to, I mean, I would. I would like to have a champion. But for guys who are in this position, it can be very exhausting, and it can feel very lonely, and it feels like you're constantly having to make decisions against the group that alienates you from the group. And the way I want you to think about all of these roles is not that boys are stuck in these roles like this. I don't do that for this reason. The reason that I do these things with the roles is I want us to have a starting place for conversation about how the boys are behaving so they understand and have a better, a better understanding for themselves about how they're going to behave in certain situations. And that sometimes what happens is they're behaving in ways that are fully contrary fully contrary to what they believe to be right. Because what I believe, and this is the same for girls as well, is that what you learn as a child in your groups about power and about conflict and how you speak about conflict is exactly what's going to happen as you get older and the kids get older, that when they're in much more problematic situations, that although the roles seem to have become invisible, the moment an abuse of power or a serious conflict occurs, the roles come right to the fore and they control the boys' movements. So it starts when the boys are, in chil are children, you know, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and you can actually really see the consequences of that all through their high school because they're taking it with them. If we don't show them and talk to them and reach out to them in ways that are meaningful to them. Okay. So I'm gonna go through a couple of things for you all that I find helpful as a parent to be able to distinguish what to do with boys when they are in conflict with each other. So I wanna be able to distinguish for you all the difference between good teasing, ignorant teasing, and malicious teasing. So good teasing is you feel liked, you don't feel put down, and if you ask, they're gonna stop, which is a hallmark, by the way, of good friendship. Ignorant teasing is you don't know how the person feels, and you say, I was just joking, relax, and you're not saying it as a way to really dismiss the person, you truly do not know. Malicious teasing. You're teased for your insecurities, you're uptight or threatened with ending the friendship, 
and is relentless and in public. So this is what I would suggest that you say to your sons if they come to you, at, especially in like elementary school and middle school, and they're trying to figure out what is going on with their friendships. There is a world of difference between good teasing and malicious teasing, but if we lump it all together with, well, the kids are just bothering me or I'm being teased, there's a world of difference that you don't know if we lump it all together. And so what I say to the boys is, if there's a democracy of put-downs, like everybody can be equally rude to each other, then you're good. But if there is not a democracy of put-downs, and one or two people has, seems to have the right to go after one person or another person consistently, then that, that is an abuse of power. And the other part is, is that for boys, I have found that the relentless and public nature of this is how they distinguish when, it's, when you have gone from something that friends can do to being over the line. That being relentless and in public, especially in public, is what really bothers the kids, understandably, because now you're being humiliated on purpose. Now, let's look at these two boys. The one on the white, in the white, is the boy who has been relentlessly teasing the, your son that I talked about in the very beginning, the boob boy. And he's just relentless. He is absolutely relentless. He thinks it's funny to, enter to, to humiliate people. The kid on the, in the black hates it, has been friends with him for a really long time. They're in eighth grade now, and he's totally sick of it, but doesn't know what to do. So there's your classic bystander in the black shirt. Now, boys can have extremely deep conversations with each other while they are playing Call of Duty, or while they are playing Halo, or while they are playing, these boys are not playing Minecraft, let me be clear, um, that any, any game they can play deep, have deep conversations. So here's what I want to show you to get yourself ready if, if, to, if your son comes to you with a problem. So if your kid is the bystander, what I want you to say is something like, I'm really sorry this is happening, Thank you for telling me, because it's a huge leap of faith for a boy to come and talk to you about his problem. And I really respect the fact that you did. Now let's think about what we can do about it. I.e., I'm not going to freak out and start calling other people. OK? Really, no freaking out. You want to have boys never talk to you again? When they tell you a problem, get right on the phone and start making phone calls. OK? Or send emails with all capitals. Your son is never going to talk to you again. And frankly, I'm sort of with him on this side, i got to tell you. So even with the best of intentions, no freaking out. So this is what I, in, in your words, three concepts I want you to get across. I'm really sorry this is happening. Thank you for telling me, I res and I respect that you did it. And now let's think about what we can do about it. But here's the concept that I really want you to think about when you're talking to your boy, to your boy who's being targeted or is bystanding. And it's the, my, my definition of the difference between snitching and reporting. So snitching, and this is all in masterminds, is telling to get someone in trouble, and the goal is to make the problem bigger and more public. That is the goal. Reporting is telling because the problem is too big for you to solve on your own, and the goal is to right a wrong. They are completely, completely, their motivations are completely different. So you've got to reiterate that to your kid when they're being targeted or when they're a bystander. And the other thing that I would say if your kid is being targeted, very similar to the bystander, is something like, wow, I'm really sorry this happened to you. Thank you for telling me. Together, we're going to work on this. No freaking out. But here's what I would also do to help your child develop social competence. Because it's these small moments, like I said, that build about abuses of power where they can speak to tr their truth to power. If, they, if the kid in the black shirt can tell the kid in the white shirt, you have got to stop ridiculing this child. Think about what that does for his sense of masculinity, of feeling good about how he handled something, that it took courage to be able to handle that, that kid, to be able to face it. He's proud, even if it doesn't go perfectly, that he had the courage to be able to stand up to, that, to his friend and be able to say this, these are moments for boys that matter, not just about doing the right thing, but about being proud of themselves as young men. And that is what we got to get to, to be proud of themselves as young men. That's what I'm here, that's what this is about. So how do you do this? 
If you can, this is the, Masterminds is filled with scripts and, and ways in which to be able to have these conversations. And really what this is about is teaching your child to think about where somebody, where that child would, con, your son would confront somebody, what is really going on that they don't like, acknowledging that everybody has the right to be treated with dignity. That's what this is about. So I'm going to show you how I do it. So I'm going to show you one conversation. Your kid comes to you. I'm having this problem. You say, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me. Let's work it out. Let's think it out. Let's think it through. Now your kid, your son, might be very worried that, you, that you're, going to want to, you're going to want him to do something about this right away. So I would say to him, there's no pressure about doing anything. We're just going to prepare about how to handle it. No pressure. Zero pressure. You can't give him the eyes. You can't give him like the try. Like, don't you think you really should talk to that child? You can't do that. It is no pressure. We're just going to think about how to think through this. So here's how I would suggest it. I would say to him, where is the best place for you to confront your friend? Where it's like, it's going to be an uncomfortable conversation no matter what, but what's the least uncomfortable? Most boys tell me that it's playing a video game, coming back from practice, or they're walking somewhere so they don't have to look at each other because they want to ease into this conversation and ease out. These conversations are lasting two minutes. Right? These are not long, drawn out conversations about how they're mad at each other. This is easing in, easing out. But here is the script to prepare. And the reason why I'm showing this is to you is because I want you to see the dynamics at play of how boys are relationally abusing each other, just like girls do. So here's the script. Mark, who's your son, who's coming to you as a bystander, you're saying, OK, they've decided that they're going to do this while they're playing Call of Duty. Then Mark has to figure out, well, what is it that happened that he didn't like? In this situation, he, you know, his friend, Andy, is, took a picture of Boob Boy and then forwarded it to everybody. So Mark is saying, forwarding those pictures of Michael was messed up, or taking those pictures, or teasing Michael about being Boob Boy was messed up. Now, is Andy going to agree? No, never. He's going to say something like, no, it wasn't. It was amazing. And you can ask your son, well, what are the most obnoxious, annoying things that the other kid's going to say to you that's going to just totally, just what is the most obnoxious, annoying things that child can say to you? And so then you're going to get some responses, some ideas. Now your child is affirming this kid's feelings. He was really mad. This is, this, this is the home, this is you sitting with him. Andy, no he wasn't. If he was so freaked out, why? no I don't. And if he was so freaked out, why didn't he say anything? This is your moment as an adult to be able to put some truth into the dynamics that are going on here. So you're sitting there with your son, walking it through, of unpeeling the, of what's, hap the ha what's happening. Because then you would have made fun of, me, of him even more. Andy says, um, it's not my fault that, I'm so, that he was so weak, and I wouldn't have cared if he'd done it to me and you laugh just as much as I did. That line right there is as sophisticated and manipulative as any girl. And boys do it a lot. So what, just to be really clear about what's going on, he's saying, it's not my fault he's so weak. He's saying, I get to decide what this kid likes or does not like. I'm stronger than him, so I wouldn't mind. Well, it didn't happen to him, so he doesn't get to decide that. And the other part is, He's bringing your son into it and saying, you laugh so you have no right to ever say anything to me. Boys consistently feel like if they laugh about something because they were uncomfortable, they can never go back and make it right. We as adults need to be able to say, sometimes we laugh because we are uncomfortable, but you can go back and make it right. And doing any part of this ever, just sitting with me right now, just this, is making it right. But Andy, doesn't care. Here's, my, here's your son again. I'm not proud of this, because, because, but I laughed because I was nervous. All I'm asking is you lay off. This would be a great opportunity for you to talk to your son about times when you laughed when you were uncomfortable and you didn't do the right thing. Andy continues to be Andy. Fine, I'll back off, but you do realize how gay you're being about this whole thing, right? Because we have lots of wonderful things going on about gay kids feeling more comfortable in schools, but saying that somebody is gay or a faggot is absolutely still the fastest way to marginalize somebody and to get them to shut up. 
So again, what we've got to do to our, for our boys is say something like, look, you cannot use the word gay or faggot or anything like that to put somebody down. Just like you can't do it talking about people's race or where they come from or their religion, you cannot use words as shortcuts to put people down about who they are supposedly intrinsically are. You put that into your own words. But these words actually have power because they are used as a shortcut to demean people. Does, now let me talk to you about as a mom. My sons have had many experiences of boys using these words. And I remember about four months ago, my son coming home and telling me that he had heard some of the boys at his camp, so this is two months ago, using the N-word and using uh, gay and faggot. So I, he, he tells me this. He's very, very worried that I'm going to freak out. He's like looking at me like, what are you going to do about this? But I, do, I, I feel very uncomfortable with this, but I'm going to tell you. And so we talked about what was reasonable for him to do. And so what's reasonable, I think, is to do gradations of boys developing their courage. So for a boy not to join into that is actually a very, very, it's a huge deal, especially when we're talking about 10, 11, and 12-year-old boys. And if you think 10-year-old boys are not using those words, I have to tell you they are. So it's, I mean, I'll speak to you as a mom and I'll speak to you as an educator, they are. Not all boys, but a lot of them. So even if your boy is not saying those words, he is certainly probably hearing them from other kids around him who have nice families and are trying to raise their kids as best as possible. So what we, I think what we've got to do is get them to a place of gradually taking and, and assuming courage. Because my son said to me, Mom, I cannot say anything to these boys right now. I, and he immediately got super defensive. And all I said to him is, when you are in that situation, what do I expect? And he said that I'm not going to add to it. And I said, that's right. And I want you to think about the ways that you're going to, that you're going to make it better. I'm not going to put pressure on you right now. We might talk about it a few weeks from now, but I'm not going to put pressure on you because I want you to think about what you can do to make that situation better. And I often think talking to boys is letting them stew on things is extraordinarily powerful because we're expecting to have these incredibly difficult conversations and then waiting for them to completely say, you know what, mom, you're completely right, and I'm going to say that the, the N-word and, and gay and all that is completely wrong the next time these boys start talking like that. We're waiting for them to say this kind of answer. If, they, if my son said that to me, I'm not sure if I would believe him. I think he was telling me that because he wants me to be quiet and stop talking to him. So I want you to think about letting boys be able to sit and stew on the uncomfortable feelings that they're having so that they can develop their own sense of competency and courage and that we are there for them as, as a person to talk to. All right. I got totally off track. Sorry. So Mark says, right, I'm gay because I want, to, I want you to stop making a kid miserable, whatever. So he's basically saying to him, that is a stupid reason to be using the word gay. Stop, right? Whatever. I don't care. It's a way of dismissing, I think, in the ways that the boys have said to me, in a positive way, I'm not going to let you stop me from talking. And then they go back to the game. They go back to the game. They ease in. They ease out. All right? Now, the last thing that I want to show you before we do a little bit of Q&A, and I asked two of the young men who helped me, because I like, sort of pulled them in. I didn't sort of. I tracked them down, stalked them, asked them to come tonight to be able to be here for you, is um, what happens if you have an aggressor? So if you get a bad news bomb, and I have gotten bad news bombs, here's the three things I want you to think about about managing your response. Number one is I want you to think about for your kid that this is one moment. It is not a lifetime. The second thing is, I don't want you, I, it's really hard not to make excuses, but just try and listen to what they're saying. The third thing is, if they're speaking to you in a way that is impossible for you to hear, like they're yelling at you, they're questioning your parenting, what I do in those situations, I've also had these experiences, have been to say something like, this is what I say because this is what I feel, is I can't hear, my heart is beating so fast right now that I cannot hear what you're saying. I've said that twice to two parents. Um, one person who ran up to me, I should have seen it from a mile away, ran up to me at that particular mom gate 
that I know from my whole life that whoever is on the receiving end of that is in a huge amount of trouble. And that was me in that particular moment. So it was, my kid was throwing rocks at their child, not accidentally, not accidentally. I'm living this life. And my, I'm probably pretty sure my kid wanted to hit the kid. I gotta tell you. So when this mom comes to me and is like in that super intense thing that she's doing, and my heart is beating so fast, I say, I, I cannot, and she's screaming at me, I say, I cannot, I really wanna hear you, but I can't process what you're telling me because I can't, I can't, my heart is beating too fast. So ask for what you need in these situations. And then, with your own child, this is what I'm suggesting. I would say, without any siblings around, there can be no siblings around because they're like feeding on the frenzies, like blood in the water, they wanna like tease their child. X was reported to me. Now, this is when you can get them in the car, all right? And you can talk to them this way, if you can calmly have this conversation. Is this accurate? Is any of it accurate? If your child says, if any of it is accurate, if your child says, okay, 1% is accurate, then you are in your place to say, well, that child has the right to think what they think and feel what they feel. You, have, you don't have the right to say they're too sensitive, just like nobody has the right to say that to you. So you're in the wrong, we have to take responsibility, and here's how it's gonna go. But if they say none of it is accurate, I would say to them, if the person was sitting right here, what would they say, even if you think it was wrong? Because if you have a very verbal child, like if you basically think that you have a lawyer without this child going to law school, they're gonna debate the other side. I've gotten them to do this several, several times. I want you to emphasize that everybody has equal rights. Everybody has the right to be treated with dignity. Everybody has the responsibility to treat others with dignity, worth, inherent worth. And here's one expectation. The book goes into other expectations, but for the sake of a, speed, of a presentation, I think one of the most important things here is the boys are so frightened of coming forward because they think their lives are gonna get worse if they come forward. I would ask you to say something like, if the life of the target gets more difficult as a result of this conversation, you will force me to take more serious actions. So what you're saying to your child is, you do not have the right to take revenge. And if you do take revenge in any way, by including telling some other kid to do something to you, to, for you, like on your behalf, I'm going to hold you responsible. This is imperative, because we have to be parents that are holding, holding the ethical line. And we don't have to know every single thing our kids are doing, but we do need to be able to hold down and be smart enough and competent enough to say, if you're even thinking about this, not an ultimatum, not like you better not, because that's not, that's not successful, it's not a great way to do it. It is, you're leaving me no choice. I can't, our family values do not, do not allow you to justify going after somebody because you think that you've been wronged. Our family values do not include revenge. Our family values include hold, holding people accountable and treating people with dignity. If we have a problem that you need to solve, right, you can say this, there's something I need to know about what's going on with this other kid that's making you so angry, tell me but it doesn't take away from the thing that you did that contributed to the problem. I think these moments, I have to tell you, during the very, very end, very end of when I was writing the book, I was working with some boys on this video that if you go on my website, you can see. And one of the boys, I'm telling you, some of these boys got into a lot of trouble. While, I mean, we have very nice boys. Two of them are guys, two of them are here today. Um, one of the guys had just gotten into a lot of trouble repeatedly with his school for good reason. And his parents had, at the conclusion of the last time he got into trouble, nice parents, good family, independent school, and they had, punished, they had grounded him for three months. And they, um, after a month, they stopped the grounding. And he deserved it. This was a very bad thing he had done to another child. So they stopped the grounding. They forgot about it. They let it go, whatever. And he said to me for the first time, he said to me, and it was like he was stumbling over his words when he was saying it, and he said, it's like I can't trust them because they went back on the grounding. And as he was saying that, it was like he was realizing this as he was saying it. I can't trust them because they went back on the grounding. And I said, yeah, because you need to know that your parents are gonna keep, they're gonna keep to their word. 
in all different kinds of ways. So with that, what I want to do is I want to bring up two of the, boy, two of the guys. One of them is a freshman in college, college, so I don't think I can refer to him as a boy. Um, who is, so what I'd like to do is to the two young men, because another one's also a sophomore. So I, and they're not boys. I don't think they, you know, the, a sophomore in high school is not a boy. So can you bring them, can you bring it up for me? Yeah. <laughs> See? We're good. Hi, I'm Will. Oh, that is loud. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, I helped Rosalind on the book the past few years, and I go to Loyola right up the street. Okay. Uh, my name is Winston Robinson. I'm a freshman at Drexel, and I also helped a bunch with the book. Where are you from? I'm from Orange County, California. That's right. All right. So while we get the mics together, I want you to think about what are their things. What are the questions, concerns, comments that you have for me, for the guys? Um, anything, because there was lots of things that I didn't talk about, like social networking, gaming, um, there's so many, so many things, so many things in my mind. So I wanted, but I wanted to open it so that it would be the most relevant for you all. So what are the questions or comments that you've got for, uh, for me or for the boys? I guess I am a mom of three sons, um, 22, 20, and 14. And I just, need, like more close to oh, I just need to know how you all see when we mess up as, as like your mom and I mess up and I don't handle a situation particularly well, I really want to work hard and do it better next time. What's your perspective on when your parents might not handle something particularly like you, what you need? Do you give them a, a second chance? I told you they were going to ask. I hope. I told you. Winston, you're up. Right, you got the um, mic. Whenever my mom met... Whenever my mom messed up, I feel like as long as she got it right the next time, I would kind of forgive her, so. What did you say? I didn't hear you. Say it again. I said, as long as my mom corrected herself and it told me that she was wrong, then I would let, let it slide, per se. What does it mean to correct her, herself? Put it up to your, put it up to your mouth. Um, just, like, talk to me about it and be like, oh, Winston, sorry, I messed up, and I was actually wrong in this point, and now I wanted to make myself right, so can you forgive me for messing up in that way? One of the things that I thought that I found the boys said to me consistently was a frustration for them with adults was when they had made a mistake, they, that if a parent said, well, people make mistakes, those kinds of statements, that that, to the boy, to the guy, felt like the, the parent or the adult wasn't taking responsibility for what they had done. And that it was absolutely transformative in the relationship for the parent to say, I made a mistake and I'm sorry. Will, do you want to add to that? I mean, my, my mom's never really done anything too crazy. I mean, <laughs> I can think of, as in middle school, and I went home one day and I was just complaining about some kids and sort of like you said, with like the all caps emails and uh, like phone calls. But I mean, I guess it's just her being super protective, which is a little annoying, but it's fine. <laughs> Other questions? That, that thing about I'm sorry is so important, so critically important. So I'm listening to you and I just read an internet thing that said, Make sure you pay attention to your child when you get in the car and ask them lots of questions and put down your phone and show them they're important. And then I'm here tonight did hearing... I, did I write that? Maybe. Because I could have written it two years ago. You might have. And, and um, now I'm listening thinking, okay, don't bombard them with questions. So I sort of want to ask the guys, like, how do I make that connection in carpool without those questions? <laughs> Honestly, I've been driving for so long that I don't remember having oh, to be Winston, in the car with my mom. Winston, two years. How long have you been driving? Four years. Okay, I, don't, like, I don't remember yeah. being in the car with my mom on a 101 when she's picked me up from like football practice. So. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, my mom does this to a certain extent. My grandfather, though, every, he calls me every day, which is adorable. But when he calls me, he's like, oh, hey, like, uh, like did you answer any questions today? I'm like, oh, yeah, I did. And he's like, Oh, what questions did you answer? It's like, oh, it's history. He's like, oh, well, what, what specifically did the teacher asked? I'm like, I have no idea, Gaga. I mean, like, I do not know. I forget. I think I got it right. Uh, the kids were nice. Everything's fine. And I think, I mean, parents do that to a certain extent. And I feel like you just need to know, like, general questions are fine. But if you get, like, this, like the more detailed you get and the more persistent you get is when people start getting a little more annoyed, I would say. And I, I would just add to it is. The, the boys were super clear about this. 
And I, I want to, you know, you can have your child, you can have a meaningful moment with your child in quiet. And I think we forget how important it is to be quiet with our kids. So you can take, of course, put your phone down, pay attention to your kid, hey, what's up? What music do you want to listen to? And you can have some decisions about that, right? But, to, but I don't think that we have to be so extreme as to ask them all these questions, especially when their friends are there. Because what if they're having a conflict with one of their friends? What if they've had a really crappy day, but they don't want to say it in front of their friends? Or maybe they want to, like you asking them this question, and I've seen this, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but as a mom, what I've seen is that the boys will hold it in. Like if they're having a conflict or they're really upset about something, they'll hold it in, and when they see you, they start getting upset. And that's a very stressful experience for them, and they want to have privacy to be able to be upset with you. Does that make sense? And so you ask, it's up, sometimes it can be so, emo, if they've had a bad day, it can be so emotional to see a parent because you start to release when you see it that having that, doing that around the friends can be too much. And then they're going to get surly and rude and you're going to misinterpret the reasons why they're acting that way. So I would split the difference, right? Of course put the phone down. Of course focus on your child. But that doesn't mean you have to ask them 20 questions. Hey, this is a really tough one for me. We have a son who is extremely intelligent and who is very interested in the capabilities of the internet and who uses that a lot for socializing. He is not good though at getting together with friends and making plans. When we need to take away the computer or whatever, for whatever reasons, we're basically taking away his social life. And when we try to say, okay, you've got a punishment, you've got to make plans on Monday, I mean, we, we don't know how to balance that. And he's not a kid who, I mean, necessarily initiates getting together with friends, but is very friendly. So how do you do that as a parent? Am I, like, doing something terrible by expecting him to get together with plans, or should I be pushing him and encouraging it? What do you think? Come on, gentlemen. Um, I mean, I might be, this may be like a little far off, but um, I really like watching the news at night. And I really, this again, it's very, proud, very dorky. <laughs> um, like my favorite show in the third grade was like Engineering and Empire on the History Channel. And the History Channel has just gotten terrible lately, but I mean, <laughs> Um, I, I like listening to stuff on the news about the Middle East and like maybe that's sort of different I mean but at the same time I know that no one at my school really does care about that and that is like not really a great way to initiate a conversation so you just like I think you had to find a balance and I think maybe when he's at home I mean let him do his thing let him have his computer but make sure that he knows that there's like different parts of life out there and that some kids may not all be interested in the internet or computers, they may be interested in like sports or other things and that he doesn't need to be interested in those things to get along with them, but he just needs to like take everything into perspective. If that, is it wrong as a parent to say, okay, you know what, every week let's try to make a plan? Well, let me, let me so the question is about like balancing your online life and your real life. Right. And those are the same things, by the way, because they're so integrated, um, which is your problem, right? Because real, you know, online life and real life is integrated. And he's making social plans in his, in his real life, right, and online. That's important to him. So if he's not doing things that you need him to do, then, I mean, I would allow him to, because social connection is important, right? So I would actually look for things, like Will's saying, I mean, if, if, by the way, if a kid is predominantly only talking about one thing, that is hyper annoying to other children. And I mean, I'm just saying this as an overall thing, that the boys have talked a lot about that, um, unless you find a kin group that that's all they want to do as well. So if that's the case, that's a very strong network for him. But what I would do is be able to tie, you need to be able to contribute to whatever it is that's having, that the problem is, but you can not, you can go from, all these hours to being very minimal, right? Or to, to, I mean, for him, taking away some of it hurts probably a lot, right? So you don't have to go from all or nothing. Giving him an hour instead of 10, right? Or whatever it is, five, means something to him. And then I have found, no matter how old the boys are, that earning back responsibility and freedom um, 
means something, right? It's you have the right, I am, and I am recognizing the, I am recognizing that you have earned back this, and you have to do it, right, when it's earned back. Does that make sense? So no extremes, because I think as parents, we go from, and that is it, I am not gonna let you be on the internet from now on, no way, that's what I do. And then I realize that that's ineffective, and I never follow through on it anyway, so then I, don't, so I lose all my credibility. So if I can do it in more manageable chunks for me and my kids, then we both have more, then it has better chance of the entire thing being successful. Um, I have a question. Um, it sounds like the mom is in charge of resolving all the issue from what we listen to. Like, and I'm curious to find out if the boys enjoy having their dads taking, like resolving problems. It sounds like the discussion are all with the moms. I'd like to share the blame a little bit if I make mistakes for later on in life, you know? I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> I'll answer this one. Um, personally, I would rather have my dad help me out with the situation, but normally if it's a social issue, my dad would normally shove it off and be like, whatever, you can figure it out. But if it's more like dealing with different adults, I feel like, but if, it, if it's like a kid issue, like if I was having issues with my friends and I was like, oh, dad, like, say I'm being bullied or something, I don't know what to do, he'd probably end up being like, just toughen up, son, like, who cares? Like, beat him up if you have to. <laughs> Which isn't realistic, but if I went to my mom and I was like, oh, I'm being bullied, and she'd be like, give me a bunch of scenarios like we've been talking about. But with my dad, it'd be like, oh, dad, like, my coach is an issue for me, then I'd rather have him deal with my coach than my mother deal with my coach because she'd just be Why? like, oh, my baby boy, what you doing? I'm going to smack you and all that stuff. <laughs> so, I don't know. It, I feel like there's just certain situations for the father figure and then the mother figure. And then as soon as you, like, learn which situations is which, then it gets better. And let me, let, and I think this is a great way to, um, to wrap up because what I think, uh, what I would ask of you tonight is that I think what we're asking, and I'm sort of speaking for them at this moment, if you disagree, you know, let me know, but I'm really asking us to change the kinds of conversations we have about boys to boys and the way in which boys are talking to us. And I would so strongly encourage men to have conversations with their sons about relationships and what's important to them. Because even what I've found is that even the most well-meaning dads, the really good dads, are not having conversations with their sons about what relationships should be or what they should expect or that it hurts when your heart gets broken or betrayals. And my experience with this is, is that boys want to have those kinds of conversations with their, their dads. I don't think it's really, as Winston's saying, figure it out. How do you figure it out? You're supposed to be my teacher. So teach them, guide them. That's what they really want. And if we don't talk to them, the other part that happens is the people that are saying not so great things to our sons, that's what they're hearing. And so they're hearing a silence a lot of times from people who really could be the teachers and the guides. And they're hearing some negative things that are really problematic, that we don't want, I don't want, I, and are, don't lend itself for boys being able to co grow up to be men of honor. So really, what I'm asking you to do is change the conversation that you're having with your sons and to be able to have them and step in to having really difficult, messy conversations. Because when we do that, our sons really want to be in relation with us. So thank you very, very much for being with me.